Um, the, the park uh, is an interesting place, and it has a lot of social events. And I, I put this movie up first to kind of give the lens at which, uh, through which I look at the, uh, so the environmental issues of non-native and native species. And when I show this slide to my class, um, I often ask if anybody uh, can name the uh, film from which the first uh, photograph is taken there. It shows the Statue of Liberty to get extra credit. So I don't know if Mary can give you extra credit for being here, but if you know the film, uh, then you know what I'm talking about. So this is basically the site at Liberty State Park before it became a park in 1963 when they shot the film The Godfather with the famous line, leave the gun, take the cannolis. Today, of course, that site looks much different, as you can see in the bottom photograph, where through basically succession, uh, we have sort of a younger northern hardwood forest developing in a site that looked like it did and was covered with the Phragmites in 1963. And so that's the context in which I, I, I kind of view this uh, controversy that we have over native and non-native species. And I've been looking at this site now, as a kid, I drove to it in the railroads, as a, you know, as a worker down in the dockyards, I saw it in its industrial uh, era. And then of course, as a park manager, I saw it for about 30 years. And I see it through that lens and it says something to me, but I really want to know what the data says about it and what the implications are for traditional ecological paradigms, what urban ecology is really teaching us. To understand that, you have to really look at uh, the soils. And yes, I do call them soils, even though the entire area is filled by the Central Railroad of New Jersey, in some places about three meters deep, consisting of everything from dredge spoils to cobbles, and then topped with cinder and clinker and, and ash, and then run over with, for 100 years by trains. I still call it soils because in the last 60 years, pedogenesis has taken place, and there is definite horizons and there is growth on top of that soil. But the contaminant issue is still there, and the contaminant issue creates a mosaic of stress factors on, on the plants that grow. And this slide you're looking at here just shows you where the hot spots are in the site and how it transitions from one hot spot to a, a site that's relatively clean, the darker sites, and then back again. So what we have is a real mosaic. And what's interesting in the past 60 years as the vegetative community has developed on it is that the vegetative community did not follow the traditional trajectory that we have labeled in all our textbooks succession. In fact, it was very much driven by some of the soil contaminants, the metals. So that early on, yes, we had uh, herbaceous and, and grass species come in. For whatever reason, most of the shrub species disappeared for at least uh, the first 30 or 40 years. And then surprisingly, very early on, we had in certain areas, tree species really dominate from the beginning. Almost from within 10 years of abandonment, we saw tree species uh, come in. So what we see here is a very non-traditional assemblage of whatever seed material, whatever spore material it could get, get to the site and be introduced to the site. We have records that actually go back to 1881 uh, of the vegetation on the site because there was always vegetation between the rail tracks and it always was the most interest to, to botanists. In fact, the 1881 study was done by um, Britain who came over to look at the species that were coming over uh, with the ships from across the world. And so we have many uh, non-native species that gathered in this area that stuck around for a little while and then disappeared. In fact, there are a total record of about 600 species at the site, one way or the other. Uh, today, there's probably an active uh, community of somewhere in the neighborhood of 187, uh, or maybe by this time, 200 species. And if you look at sort of the timeline of that trajectory here from 1969 through 2003, You'll see basically how the area went from bare soil to a, a vegetative community over that past, that was about 30 or 40 years. And as I said earlier, interestingly, through the 60s, 70s, and into the 80s, really you didn't get much in the word of a shrub guild. Uh, the pioneer forest developed in some areas very early, and then it seemed to repeat itself. 
In other words, we didn't get really a mature uh, colony uh, or the climax species such as hickory and oak and primarily oak until much later in the scenario. And, and in fact, even though oaks surrounded the site in the street plantings, uh, they didn't migrate into the site until the last 10 years and really have taken off only after Sandy. So, so we've got an interesting sort of mix of how the site has assembled itself over the past 50 years. And if we want to look at the composition of those species, this bar graph is uh, something that uh, Salisbury and myself and Klaus just put out uh, this year about what were native and uh, unknown or non-native species uh, that came to the site from the years 2008 to 2016. The study was done on 27 plots that were monitored uh, over that period of time. And what's interesting to me is that you can, if you look at the conglomerate, if you look at this summative uh, quota here, you can see see that that the mix of native and non-native is about 50%. And that's after almost 50 years of assemblage development. What's more interesting to me is the trajectory on that is the site, as you saw in the first photograph, was dominated by non-natives early on. And it's more recently, we've seen more natives come into the site. And that's not standard per guild. If you look at the grasslands, of course, uh, Calamagrosis and other non-native species tend to dominate in the grasslands. If you look at the forbs, well, you have about 60% non-natives. If you look at the shrubs, it's about 50% uh, natives to non-natives. And if you look at the trees and the in, uh, species there, we're actually getting more native species in over recent times. And uh, that has about 60% uh, natives compared to non-natives. If you look at diversity over that same period of time, you'll see that diversity in this fairly old stand is still increasing. Uh, it increases especially in uh, the forest guild. You'll see over here that the number of species in that uh, forest guild has increased considerably over the period of 2008 to 2016. But what's also interesting in that same period of time is that the cover of the forest guild has actually decreased. And this is probably the effect of Sandy. We had some damage during Sandy. We had a lot of salt water intrusion, which took out some of the uh, pine that generated there. And, and so we're seeing while well, species are, well, the species number is increasing, the cover is decreasing, which means we're getting newer species coming into those holes that were created uh, probably during the Sandy event. All this kind of boils down to uh, some some bigger picture items. If, if you look at the site that uh, is in this photograph here, and you're familiar with the site over the past 50 years, you can see that, and I know this is hard to, to depict, but you can almost see the old railroad tracks in this site. They're still there in some form or another. They're still influencing the site in some form or another. Uh, but what's what's more interesting to me is, is that you've got several grass and forb communities that have developed on the site. Now, now this particular subsite here was one of the more recently disturbed sites. It was disturbed back in 1987 uh, because of a, a spill of, of paint material. And what's developed on that side here, you can see in the background here, you've got some uh, grasses that are developing and, and the dominant there is calamagrosis. In the foreground, you can see that there are, are four, uh, basically Forbes there, and the dominant is is primarily um, uh, Artemisia. Now I know you're saying Artemisia is one of the you know three most wanted plants on the North American continent. That it is a very aggressive plant, but in my mind, you have to remember that Artemisia was brought over here several hundred years ago, and it was brought over primarily as a bitters to make beer. So how bad can a plant that makes beer be? You know, let's let's give it a little bit of credit. But what's also interesting in this in this photograph here is, is that you can see in sort of this area around here that in between the grasses and and the, and the artemisia that uh, you have a stand of goldenrod that kind of fights its way in. <laughs> so we did some work on on the goldenrod and the borders between these uh, colonial plants that were growing on on these soils. And interesting, what we did find over a period of time is that 
On drier years, yes, Artemisia tends to invade into the goldenrod territory and becomes more dense. On wetter years, the goldenrod holds its own and actually at some point has expanded into some of the Artemisia area. So if you look at sort of what's happening now and you project that back, realizing that Artemisia and Phragmites and uh, Polygonium uh, that in uh, polygon rather were probably really dominant species. Our, our study from 1972 really shows that you know those were the dominant herbaceous species at the time. Uh, and if you look at what's happened now and what's happening now, you kind of get the story that you know yes, there's early uh, thrust of these uh, very uh, aggressive species. Uh, they come in, but they're changing the soil as they come in. In fact, in this case, they're actually building the soil. And by adding organic matter, they change the soil to the point where other species uh, could uh, survive with them. We see around the edges, you'll see uh, some uh, not only poplars and birch, but sumacs coming in. And as these soils build, you're getting an increase in both diversity and an increase in the number of gills that are present on the site. So in terms of couching this in, in sort of uh, the theory of, of what's happening, uh, we feel that in sites that are anthropogenic in nature, that the amount of uh, sort of feedback, positive negative feedback is a little bit different than you would get on normal sites. That positive feedback loops occur, especially when these soils are building. And we've also done some work on sort of the, the mycorrhizal communities under some of these vegetative uh, assemblages and found that while the mycorrhizal communities do differ, they really play a major role in the attenuation of the metals and allow for the uh, above ground vegetation to really establish itself. So, so in, in these stress conditions, positive feedback loops tend to dominate for a much longer period of time. And if you're asking me about uh, the, the potential for ecological risk in such sites, um, what we're seeing because of these unique assemblages, because these plants that have both colonized and really adapted to these, these situations, these urban situations, um, most of them have innate mechanisms that do not allow for the transfer of uh, the metals into the aerial parts of the plant. This graph here or this chart here shows you that, you know, the the stem, the root, the stem, and the leaf. And we took the plants apart and uh, looked at their translocation and found that most of the metals are maintained in the soil. The latest study shows that most of that metals were, were maintained basically because of that unique association with the mycorrhizal community. But we also found that that some of the non-native species are very good at mitigating soil contaminants, uh, especially frag and especially artemisia. So in, in terms of the diversity of functioning and allowing the system to become a healthy ecological system, some of these non-native plants are playing a critical role. And I think that's sort of the, the important sort of bigger message in all this is that um, some of these unique assemblages in a time when uh, climate change is, is really uh, changing the status quo of, of most vegetation assemblages across the entire continent, uh, that we should be looking more at how these things function than what is actually there in terms of composition. Because I don't believe at this time structure is really representing function. It's not a surrogate. And so as Tim Flannery said in, you know, in his book, The Eternal Frontier, the North American continent with its rapid movement of species is sort of the bellwether in, in this era of climate change that we have. And I think the urban sites that we're sitting now and showing that stress early and showing how the plants are adapting to that stress are good indicators and, and may be uh, harbingers of what's to come. There's another side to this story that I, I think is, is more on the social side that I believe uh, we should consider. And, and that's sort of the language that we use in articulating the problem of uh, non-native versus native species. 
you know, we're very good in our bubble of academia being sort of, um, you know, reductionist and we can put things in different quadrants and think of them, you know, only in that quadrant. But I don't think the real world works like that. And I think that our language uh, over the past 20 years of uh, concerning invasive species is, is somewhat disconcerting in that terms like, um, you know, task force, invasive species task force or strike teams, you know, add to sort of the rhetoric that's happening at the social level that, that I don't think is helpful. I, I think we can actually uh, sort of lead the way on this uh, and uh, understand that how we talk about uh, ecology is, is, is important, that the, uh, the community itself, that the larger community really under, understands that and, and it does not carry the overtones which are so prevalent in the divided society we have today. So uh, that's my little spiel on, on sort of in, invasive species and, and non-native and non-native uh, compositions. And, and, and my position that the idea that these novel assemblages actually are functioning fairly well in certain situations and are adapted to the types of changes that we may be seeing in the future uh, gives some value to what we may think of as uh, value assemblages. And I'd just like to give credit to many of the people who have worked at the, at the study site over the past uh, 20 years or so and uh, make sure that they're acknowledged for their contributions. So uh, that's basically uh, the overall of, uh, what I wanted to say, and I, I just like to know if there are any thoughts or questions at this time. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Frank. This is Mary back again. So we have a couple of questions here that I'm going to ask you and uh, let you respond and um, come back with the next one. So the first question is, um, what are the implications of non-native plants outgrowing or replacing native plants? Sure, I, I, I don't doubt that, that that's happened. We've seen many studies where that's happened. And, uh, you know, if, if you look, you know, at biodiversity websites around the world, they'll, they'll label invasive plants as probably the number two threat, right? But I also think that we tend to look at that type of situation in a very short period of time. We look at it from the context of what's happening today, right now, right? And I do believe that if we take a longer view of things, we'll see that, well, uh, maybe it's not exactly how we perceive it to be today. For example, Phragmites, the, the, the scourge of uh, the coastal communities, right? If you look at Phragmites up and down the Hudson and, and, uh, and look at the diversity values in those communities, they actually have increased over the past 20, 30 years. If you look at the, the, the uh, you know, the, the invasive uh, gypsy moth caterpillar, right? And the story about that and how today it's, it's sort of blended in and, and the, the soil fungi and, and the viral uh, pests are really controlling that population. If you look at, you know, the, uh, well, there's just so many examples where given time, putting that much biomass out there, you know, something learns uh, how to take advantage of that. And, and so our our perspective and our view of, of time tends to be relatively short. You know, let's be honest, 65 million years ago, there was nothing on this continent, right? And today we see a whole different story. And every time uh, the, the climate changes, things change dramatically. So so I think it's it's a matter of uh, time frame and how we really view these things. Thanks, Frank. Next question is, I've heard that climate change is affecting the photosynthetic rate in plants that follow a C3 carbon fixation process. Have you seen these differences in the plants you study? Well, I, I haven't done a lot of, of that, but we did have, have one study looking at C3 versus C4 and showing that, yeah, there is a trend that it can alter the effectiveness of, of some of those uh, some of those species. Uh, again, because we don't have a, a lot of that here in the in the urban context that I dealt with, not really sure about it, but I, I have seen some preliminary data that says uh, it, it is happening, yes. Great, so the next question is, what is your stance on genetically engineering plants to aid in ecological restoration or species repopulation? 
For example, I recently learned about the blight-resistant Darling 58 American chestnut, and whether or not it should be deregulated is a very controversial topic. Just curious uh, on your That's a, a good thought because uh, I'm as confused as everybody is on this. I have uh, you know, a chestnut tree out in my front yard right now that I bought, which is uh, the hybrid variety, not the genetically engineered variety. And so what we've done there is, you know, taking genes from uh, uh, from the Chinese uh, version and stuck them here, and it's doing well. But but here's here's my problem with with the genetically engineered type. I, I think I think we have to be really uh, sure about this and realize that we don't have control. Just as we don't have control of other species coming over here and and populating North America. You know, once you put that, let that genie out of the bottle, you don't have control. And and so the selection process here with genetically engineered material, right, is is gives the genetically engineered material an advantage that has not been selected for by the intricacies of of the environment that it will eventually live in. So so I do have concerns. I understand that. I believe it was the a gene that actually came out of corn that was engineered into uh, the chestnut to make it resistant to the blight. And the, the people from Cornell who I talked to said that, that they have no questions that it's safe. And uh, I think in 50 years, we'll probably learn the truth. Okay, so the, someone commented that it was wheat that was used for that. Uh, wheat, okay. Good. <laughs> so, yeah. so um, Slightly different direction, but we'll go back to uh, ecological restoration in a minute. And one one attendee wants to know, what do you think is the best way to communicate your work to the public? Well, that's that's an interesting uh, question because the, the restoration plan we had done for that interior section of Liberty State Park, which was actually predicated on the concept of fourth nature, allowing these uh, novel communities to run their course and to be uh, – to, to work with the changes that are coming. And, and well, that, that plan that was in place and was supposed to be actually constructed 10 years ago until the Christie administration took over uh, has now been scrapped and, and they're now looking at uh, a whole new way of doing things. And of course, the new administration is risk averse and they want to cover the whole site. And so we've started the same controversy all over again. Uh, so to get Specifically to the question, the, the idea of communication of what actual risk is, is key. Because we're all predicated on what I call the love canal syndrome, right? The idea that if there's contamination in the soil, it must be mitigated. And so getting phytostabilization to be a valued strategy has become a very difficult, difficult proposition. And we've got to find examples, and, and, and my examples all come from Germany, where I, I think they've done a, a really interesting job on using fourth nature sites and inviting people in and giving people that ecological identity that's truly urban. You know, and I think that's where we've got to go. We've got to be able to find those examples that show that ecology, you know, is not something that we take from a book and then put onto the landscape that basically ecological restoration should be done in the context of the changing environment we're living in. And so using fourth nature and using the idea that we may not know what the end point is, and we've got to design systems that allow for that variation, you know, is where I think we should be taking people in terms of ecological restoration. The next question is not a follow-up, but it kind of builds along this. And it, the question is, we in the Intermountain West are attempting to build an arc of genetic diversity to take us through climate change and rebuild native communities of plants in a future climate. Is this effort tilting at windmills? <laughs> well, you know, if, if, um, if you've only heard me talk about ecological restoration in urban areas, you might say that I, I think that your efforts are useless. Absolutely not. You know, I think there, again, it's contextualized. There is a time and a place for, for everything. And, and, and believe me, maintaining the genetic diversity that exists for some future uh, condition that will exist, you know, I think is, is, is a very valuable effort. 
But I don't think that we ought to take that concept of what is the appropriate genetic material and apply it to the changing urban worlds and the changing worlds that, that we're dealing with. Because I think that's just, that, that's fruitless. But, but understanding where we are and how those associations work and what that genetic material is, I think that's, that's a very valuable effort in and of itself. It just doesn't apply well to the urban context. So, um, and Tendi asks, when does a non-native organism become a native organism? And they're saying, <laughs> <laughs> I am thinking yeah. about starlings in particular. Is there a number of years yeah. for an organism to become seen as native? Thing, the rats with wings, right? Starlings, okay. Well, that's why I opened this, this, this uh, talk with the idea that, hey, Klaus is, you know, a recent immigrant. I'm second generation. And the guy that wrote the book is from Australia. So, so this idea of nativeness and, and when does nativeness actually take hold is sort of an interesting concept and one that is best discussed with scotch because, because <laughs> there is as many right answers or there are as many answers as there are people. But I think the key is, is that, that nativeness involves the interdependence uh, within a system, right? And as you can begin to show those interdependence, uh, for example, you know, I'll go back to the scourge of, of frag. I, I think in, in, in some areas we're showing that interdependence that is growing over the past 30 years fairly rapidly. And the other way to look at this too is, is that, you know, frag is a very aggressive plant. And in the urban context, because everything's disturbed, it's become, you know, the dominant plant. But it also is wonderful because of the thick rhizomes and because of the uptake potential at mitigating for contaminants. So if we look at structural, if we look at structural diversity versus functional diversity, and we begin to understand how the functional diversity and value that functioning, how it works and, and value that, uh, I think we'll, we'll begin to break down those walls of, well, that's an immigrant plant and that's a native plant and, and begin to, to sort of see where those interdependencies really lie. Again, there, I don't find an answer. Is it 100 years? Is it 200 years? You know, I'm not really sure, but let's look at the gypsy moth. We're, we're into the gypsy moth, what, a little over 100 years now? I think it's becoming native. Well, I have a comment. It's not a question, and then we can go back to questions that someone wrote. I have many questions and thoughts. When can we sit down with the scotch? Frankly, <laughs> personally, I think bourbon is better, but great, well, work with, <laughs> great work with deep philosophical and practical impl implications. What can be better? So. Um, Thank Here's you. Here's the next question. So most of our crop agriculture is based, as you know, on all over the world. Some like corn slash maize are entirely dependent on cultivation to survive. So we have agriculture dependent on natives and horticulture on a mix. Shouldn't we be focused on building communities rather than purging species to favor natives? Yeah, the, so so this is a question that goes, goes back to, uh, you know, let, let's be real there. We're only here because of, of, of things like uh, artificial fertilizer, right? And we're only here because of things like uh, genetic engineering of crop plants. And, and that, that's very true. So, so how do we blend these, these two disciplines that, you know, are both based in science and both so different in the, in the way they approach things? And so I, I take heart in things that are happening like at the Land Institute, where you're looking at perennial uh, wheat and looking at perennial crops that actually build soils. You know, coming from my research, it, it kind of goes back to how do you build that strong foundation and, and, and make things ecologically viable. And so I, I do believe that, that there are opportunities to do that. And I would, would hope that we can actually produce enough product using those opportunities someday in the near future. It, 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 it's a great question, and uh, Mary, I think I would go with you on this question, go the bourbon route, uh, because uh, right now we're trying to figure it out, aren't we? Well, we'll have to figure out how to, <laughs> how to make this work. So uh, next question is, is climate change then not just a source of damage, but a source of environmental protection as non-natives bring new functionalities to an ecology? Uh, there, are, there are a couple of, of books out that I've recently looked at that 
kind of go down that road and it, one of them about how you know non natives are going to save us all so so um is there a, a grain of truth in in sort of that statement I, I i believe there is i believe there is uh some value in uh, the adaptability of some of these aggressive plants during a time when uh, many of our plants that of oh, let's face it over the past uh well in, in this part of the world you know over the past uh, 13,000 years there's been uh, stability and, and in fact for the last 100,000 years there's been a good deal of stability and we're losing that stability and so plants that are relatively uh, broad-based you know generalist versus specialist are actually going to be the ones uh, that su survive the transition and, and again when I say survive the transition you know I'm, I'm thinking long term and, and in this case, long term may be measured in tens to hundreds of years rather than thousands of years. But plants are, will be able to that adapt to that. And you know, I, I like Artemisia. It, it gave us beer early on, and in the urban areas right now, it's given us green. And in the urban areas, green is good. So Frank, that was the last of the questions today. Um, really appreciate your taking the time. Really thoughtful. Discussion issues we need to 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 uh think about that was really stupid that was redundant but <laughs> <laughs> it's without bourbon but um it, i think you presented a great story about a place that's very close to us and interesting research so i want to thank you for your time is there anything else you. to end uh, with frank i'd just like to end with uh the idea that um you know i'm always open for these conversations i, I think the dialogue around how we talk about uh, native and non-native species and what restoration means in an era of uh, climate change is a, is a really interesting topic. So get in touch with me. I'd be happy to talk to anybody.